So uh, during that last set, the phone rings, and uh, I hear this deep voice that sound, kind of sounds familiar, and uh, maybe you <laughs> folks will recognize it. <laughs> what are you doing, Zach? How you doing, Waylon? Pretty good. I'm sitting here trying to wish I could yodel. <laughs> you know, me and, me and Chris Christopherson have always wanted to yodel, and I tried to yodel on a couple of records. People think that's kind of maybe... Uh, you know, corny and things until they try it. It's a hard thing to do. It's a hard way to go because you, you can, uh, you'll get your voice to do that way, but being on keys is another story now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate you playing my albums. You, how does it feel to be in the minority? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, Willie. Oh, uh, no, I have, I've been having a pretty good time. And, uh, I don't know when we're going to be back up in that area. Well, I have some... Actually, I was, I was saying before to you on the phone that I have some tickets to give away for uh, a show you don't be doing in Connecticut, I think on the 9th. Does that sound right to you? December yeah, 9th? that is right, yeah. So, uh, so you know more about me than I do, <laughs> but you ain't got brain damage. <laughs> well, I haven't had as long to get brain damage. Yet, so. <laughs> I call it name damage. Yeah. Now, you know what? You get out on the road, and you're out there... And Pretty soon you forget where you're at, and then you forget what time it is and when, you know, and what day of the, the week or the month. And uh, it's really kind of disorienting. I don't think you're supposed to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I was telling you a while ago, I was telling you a while ago, about we're in Myrtle Beach right now, and it's kind of hazy. I'm not really a, a guy that likes that foggy, hazy look. Kind of makes you, I don't know, depression <laughs> a little bit. But anyway, they got. Uh, we get out on the road, and there's a thing called road humor and bus humor. It means you'll laugh at the silliest things on earth when you're out on the road. Some reason, your mind, I don't know, I guess you kind of got to get in a dingy state in order to go out there and stay very long. Well, you were just, I should just hit the road because you were in the studio for a while recently, right? Yeah, we uh, we just did a, a new Highwayman album. And uh, it turned out really good. You know, if... Uh, if people only knew what we really sounded like before they work on it, we sound a little like a train wreck <laughs> when we first get together because we're we're all we all have our own styles. And of course, Willie has that real laid back that what they call back phrasing style. Right. And we really have to be there a day or two to kind of pull toward something that resembles something in the middle, you know. But there's nobody enjoys and has more fun at it than we do. Cause we all like each other and, um, and, have, and, and have been friends for a long time. I heard, I heard a little bit of the album. I heard uh, briefly, Mark played me some over the phone, held up the phone to the speaker. So I heard some of the stuff you did, and it sounded really good. You did the Steve Earle song I thought was excellent. Yeah, that, um, yeah the uh, Devil's Right Hand. Right, and then you had uh, do a good, real good version of the Billy Joe song from, the, from his last album. Live you Forever. know, I did, uh, I did the, um, the song that... Um, the Devil's Right Hand, and uh, it was in a movie called Betrayed, and it was on one of my uh, my uh, M MCA albums. I've always loved that song, and I, I thought it I thought it got overlooked because you know. But even now, though, I think it maybe was a little ahead of its time then because I think it's more in right now. And the Billy Joe Schaefer thing is really good. I really like that. Yeah, that was my favorite song from uh, from his last album. Yeah, he was, a, he, you know, what a writer. He's always been a great writer. <laughs> we call him the great, world's greatest redneck writer. <laughs> yeah, but he's a good one, that's for sure. Yeah. So, uh, what's next? Well, you got the album coming out. You got this one, is the Highwayman coming out, do you know? Uh, you know, I guess it'll be a spring album. And uh, I'm in the middle now of writing uh, with uh, Lenny K. a uh, book about about me and uh the more i read about it the more i realize i'm a mess <laughs> <laughs> but we're having a good time doing that but i'm just uh kind of coasting along as long as i'm having fun i'm going to keep doing this and, uh, <clears throat> and i am still having fun and i i really enjoy that one-on-one -on -one you like performing i think i enjoy it more now and understand it more now than i did 20 years ago 30 years ago <clears throat> well, that's interesting because a lot of your songs, at least on the new album, on the Waymore's Blues Part Two, it's some of them. It seems to be that seems to be a real theme of uh, of the songs. You know, looking back on the past and, and yeah, getting yeah. something from it. You know, songs like Wild Ones and yeah. and uh, as well as Old Timer, some of the other ones on that. 
I kind of, it's kind of that way. I don't know. But uh, every once in a while, I even, uh, when I go home, I do a lot of driving around and looking. I think maybe you're looking for your own youth or, or checking it over, seeing what, you know, if, if, if you, not, not that you want to change it or anything, or would you change anything that, anyway, you know. But it's just kind of uh, trying to figure it out. You know, I get in the car when I go home and I drive around a little old Texas town. The funny thing about my hometown is it hasn't changed <laughs> since I was there. I mean, even the trees were, was our big playground, you know. Had a big bunch of trees down there. We dug caves, and, and uh, they're still there. They're still, really still there. And uh, I was taking my son around. I was a fire bug when I was a kid. I almost burned that whole town down. <laughs> <laughs> I even, we even, there's a place called Hilltop Dairy, and it's just barely a rise above the horizon, you know. And I remember looking up there, and we had set that whole fire, that whole prairie on fire. You set a whole prairie on fire? Yeah, we had done eel smoking. <laughs> you know, we big smokers in them days. We'd smoke pickles if they weren't just so hard, soggy and hard to light. But uh, it was, I think uh, maybe this album's a little that way. I've been writing a few songs like that. Setting things on fire? No, about the, <laughs> <laughs> you know, about the past and everything. I should write one about that, I guess. What was the? I heard a little bit of the song that you wrote for the Highwayman album. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. it sounded. It was. Uh, what was the title of it? It's called um, "I Do Believe." You know? I'll tell you that came about. It's the closest thing to a spiritual song I've ever written. You know? And it's. Uh, it's not really meant to be that that much, but I have a wonderful friend who's a preacher. He was also with Dr. King, Martin Luther King, hmm. and was. Uh, one of the uh, advisors for, for Martin Luther King. His name is Will Campbell, and uh, he's he's what I think a preacher really ought to be. You know, he's he's very wise. He's very well educated, and uh, he uh, but he's just the neatest guy in the world. If you ask him, a, you know, if you go to him and ask him about something, he'll act like he may be the dumbest guy in the world, and then all of a sudden he'll turn around and say something gives you your answer that doesn't have anything to do with your question. So uh, that may sound kind of silly, but thats he's my co closest thing to a guru that I have in my life. <laughs> but he asked me one day, he said, uh, what do you believe? He was talking about religion. And I answered him with, uh-huh. <laughs> and he thinks that was the best answer he had ever heard, you know, as an affirmation. So one day I got to thinking, I said, well, you may, you know, a lot of people, they misinterpret some things I say, and so I just wrote this song. It was for my own mental therapy, I guess, as much as anybody's. And it's really, it really is what I believe. I think that uh, faith and uh, um, a lot of things in spirituality gets, you know, gets caught in the trappings of religion sometimes, and uh, it gets it gives it all the wrong picture. Now that's my opinion. <laughs> Everybody has an opinion, I guess. <laughs> in fact, when I when I did the song, I told the guys, I said, "You guys, you can say no to this if you want to, because you may not believe this way, but this is, and you don't have to be part of it." But they all found something in it themselves. Well, I guess all of the rest of them too, in their own way, have always done. I mean, Cash has always done all those spiritual songs from uh, his early days. This is my probably my first yeah. one that, that I've ever written or anything. And Willie has. Uh, you know, uh, in God's eyes, and all those songs too, as well. Uh -huh. So I guess you're just uh, finally finding your own in that sense as well, too. Well, uh, this may be—I may do another album of them, or I may never do another one. You never right. know me. You know, if I don't believe, if I don't really, if it's not something I really feel and believe in, I'm, I'm really not. I uh, have a hard time making it be real. Huh. So, Waylon, tell me a little bit about the new album that's out right now, The Waymore's Blues Part 2. I had, uh, you know, I had written all those songs. I had decided I wasn't going to record anymore. Uh, I was with Epic Records, and they made this statement. They didn't think anybody would play my records, and uh, that I was about over with. So. I, guess, I guess they hadn't come up to New York for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided, well, that's okay. I've had a good run, you know, and uh, I'm going to be just fine. And then I started writing songs. I mean, just more than I'd 
hadn't written in years. Just every week I would come up with something, and sometimes two, a couple of songs. And they seemed to be the easiest thing for me to do. And then all of a sudden I said, well, what am I doing if I'm writing all of these? And the thing was, it was like Don had asked me four or five years before to work with me. You know, like he wanted me to, wanted to produce an album on me. In fact, we wanted, he wanted me to join a band that he was going to put together to work clubs with people like Dylan and, and hmm. like that. And, uh, but we never could get that together and couldn't get together working together. Because uh, seemingly he was busier, I was. And uh, but how we met was with uh, uh, he had come to town and asked me to sing on some Bob Seger albums, do harmony with Bob Seger. Right. And uh, but anyway, Don and I, you know, we got to be friends, but we never got to work together, and uh, we really never knew why, neither one of us, because uh, when we were down at the 60th birthday party at Willie's. He came over and he said, you know, I never knew why we never got to work together. So someone had gotten in between us, I guess, and it didn't work. But uh, he said, I said, well, I, I heard you didn't have time. And he says, well, let me tell you something, how much time I got. He said, I'm, I'm going to be working with the Rolling Stones. You get your songs together. When you get ready to record, I'll put the Rolling Stones on hold. <laughs> and he did. They were waiting out at his house while we recorded, <laughs> but uh, which was a great compliment to me. You know. <clears throat> anyway, we um, we got in there and had more fun. Most of the, most of that album is live. It's just you know we didn't change anything. Right. We just did it, and it was more fun that way. And uh, when I went in, I told him, I said, you know, everything you guys have ever heard me do, just forget it. You know, I said I want to do something different. I, and don't try to make it sound like Waylon Jennings. I'll handle that part, you know. Right. And so John, Don told him, says, why don't we do this like an impressionist or something like that? So that hit it right on the head. So it's different. And, I, I'm, you know, there's two albums I can that I've ever done. I did this one and Dream in My Dreams album that I can listen to and not want to skip a song every once in a while. In fact, I can listen to it from the top to the bottom and... It, I wouldn't change a thing about it. I know when uh, I spoke to you last winter when we did that, we had a, a whole thing where we played you and Willie for about a five hours straight last winter. Uh -huh. And uh, I remember I called you down in Florida and we did a little bit of an interview. Um, at the time you had said that you didn't really care how this record sold, that you had spent a great time uh, making it, that that was really the important thing. In it really is. You know what? Uh, sales have nothing to do with whether an album is good or bad. Um, it's kind of like I was in Albuquerque, New Mexico, not too long ago, and I uh, sold out like this. It's about an 18,000-seater Coliseum. Right. And uh, we, they had never sold it out before. And uh, we were doing a rodeo thing there. And never lost a person. They were right there, you know, when we played after after the, um, the rodeo. They've been doing this for 20 years and had never sold it out. You know, at least 10 years. Well, this station that uh, was called Young Country, you know, and, and uh, they were really saying, you should feel great This is that you sold this out. You should feel great. And I got them on the air, and I said, well, let me ask you something. You guys play my records? And they said, no. <laughs> and I said, this is the first time? I said, has any of the new country artists been here? And they said, yeah. I said, did they sell out? And he said, no. And I said, but I did. And they said, yeah. And I said, well, I should show you how much control you have over the people. I said, you control the charts. You don't, you don't control, uh, you know, control the people at all. And they didn't quite like that, but I didn't expect them to. But <laughs> the whole thing is people make up their own mind what they want to see. We had uh, Tom Paul Glaser called. We had him on the show. Uh, it must have been about a month ago. And one of the things he was saying was uh, how he, uh, you know, in the 70s, when, he, when things were going well for him and he really had a chance, it could have, may have been possible for him to change his style a little bit around to to get, you know, maybe sell some more records, but he decided, he, you know, the idea was he would just do what he wanted. Um, and in a way that it's the same true of, you know, all, of that, all that scene of you and, and Willie and Waylon, that one of the reasons why, you know, we all like you so much and the reason why you still have that integrity is because you didn't maybe in the 70s say, I could sell more yeah. records by doing something else. Or I never could. I uh, never was uh, one to let somebody tell me about my music. I never understood that. I never, you know, I've been a hard one on critics, too. I told him, I said, well, I don't even know what I'm doing. How in the hell do you know? <laughs> you know? Right. 
It's like I never go into a studio with a set plan for something. I just I have a direction, you know, like I want it to be a waltz tempo or something like that. But I kind of like to let things happen for themselves, you know, in the music. And, and it will change with time, even on stage. But I learned something from Paul Simon that was really important to me. I went to one of his shows, you know, and I watched him do things that he, you know, that uh, I knew he was so sick of that he had done all through the years. Right. But he made them really special. And I said, well, you know, that's great. We should do that. We should never get tired of what we're doing, even if we change it a little. Make it special because somebody came and paid good money for a ticket just to hear that one song. So that's helped me a whole lot since I'm, you know. But I, as far as, um, you know, when I came to town in Nashville, it was like, well, records were selling five and 10,000 copies, you know, for one thing. Right. And uh, you would go into a studio. You had uh, four songs. You had to do four songs in three hours. And what, what you got was what you got. And a lot of wonderful songs fell through the cracks, just like that. And what they would do is cut... Twelve sides, and what what didn't what wasn't a single they would they, they would put on the album, which uh, it worked. It was a system the way they did things. You had to record in the um, the record company studio, use their engineers and their producers. You uh, in a way it looked like you had some say about what you recorded, but you really didn't. They were the ones, and they even had publishing companies that they would push some songs on you that weren't really any good, but they. The record company had to publish it. Right, because they wanted the royalties from it. And finally, I um, I saw that wouldn't really work for me at all, and I just backed up and said no. And I cut an album then called This Time. And I went to another studio, and they said, if, if we let you release this song, that means our contract with the recording engineers will be broken. And that will mean that we'll have to sell our studios. And I said, this is all you got. I'm not doing that anymore. You know? And, uh, you know, I had a production deal, but I still had to record in their studios. Therefore, they still record with me or control the music. So it, um, that broke the system, that very thing. They, after that, they sold the studios, and uh, they didn't have the control anymore, and I didn't have to use their producers. Or, and then that's when the things started happening for me because that was the first number one album I had was, right. was, uh, was this time. Yeah, it seems uh, almost ironic, but it's when people start doing what they want to do that uh, usually things begin happening. For well, you, should, you know what? I got told them, they said, what do you now? What are you going to say? Everybody should fight the system? And I said, no. If I leave any legacy, if I leave anything for people coming after me, it's, it's this, is that you always have a right to do things, you know, I mean, there's um, one more time, and that's your way. You, you have a right to try that at least once. There's always one more way to do things, and it is your way. And that doesn't mean that you don't try it their way, <clears throat> because you should trust people's ideas, and you should have, have people in there who have ideas about you. But you should always, there's always one more way to do things. It's your way, and you have a right to try it. And that goes with anything in life. You have a right to try it at least once. I got a question for you. Okay. What's the deal with this Elvis song and your new album? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I walked into my house, and a girl by the name of uh, Beth Chapman and uh, Kimmy Rhodes and my wife Jessie were writing a song. And I had on a T-shirt that said, Nobody Knows I'm Elvis. <laughs> and Beth just fell out on the floor. She said, You're the only one that could write that, and you're the only one that could sing it. <laughs> so I never thought any more about it. And then one morning I woke up on the bus, and it was about 3 in the morning. I got up in the shotgun seat and sat there and wrote it. And then I heard the story, too, about this guy that came up. And Shel Silverstein told me this story. And this is where the core of the, uh, the bridge came from, in it? When he said, this, uh, this guy came up to this girl's house, and he's about five foot two and bald-headed. And he told this girl he was Elvis in disguise, and they needed a place to hide. So she hid him in this, her basement for about two or three weeks before she figured out he wasn't Elvis. And he kept telling her he was taking her to Graceland and all that stuff. <laughs> it was like, and I did run into the guy, too, that... That uh, runs this uh, this organization said Elvis is alive, which is a joke, you know. I mean, right. 
And uh, I don't know. We have a hard time giving up our heroes. It's like these tabloids saying that uh, Kennedy is somewhere up in the Alps in a rest home, you know. Right. And he lived through the assassination <laughs> attempt. It's the same thing with the Billy the Kid. It doesn't matter if they're famous or infamous. You know, and here comes brilliant idiots like Oliver Stone to mess with right. history, you know. <laughs> but he thinks that's all right. He says just another point of view. We get a lot. We get... We've had those guys like that all through history. That's why that we have uh, that Jesse James didn't die in his home, and and that he really died in Oklahoma, and uh, all these people, you know, they just never. Only one that they have let die, and uh, was was Abraham Lincoln. Nobody ever tried to say that he wasn't dead, you know. Hmm. But uh, you know, like Booth, they say he got away. They're sure right, of that, right. you know. Well, I'll tell you this, Will, and if you really are Elvis, I suppose you're making a lot more royalty money than anyone's ever figured all these years. <laughs> he made more after he was dead, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah. You know, it's funny, you mentioned Shel Silverstein as giving part of the idea for that song. One of the transitions that I used uh, a couple of weeks ago for your Elvis song was, uh, you know, the Shell song, Nobody Knows? Uh, not, uh, sorry, uh, Rough on the Living? Uh, oh, uh, he sung me that song. Right, yeah. right. In the liner notes, he says it's not about Elvis, but uh, <laughs> yeah. it kind of works in that way, too. It does, yeah. But um, they, uh, Shell's one of my best friends. He's he's a he's a good dude. He really is. And uh, he's you know what a writer in any category, or just what a talent in any category you go at. You know, he's the greatest storyteller in the world. And uh, of course, the children's books he's written and, and uh, wonderful plays and, and wonderful country songs. Do you still see him? Is he? Oh, I see him every once in a while. He hides a lot, you right. know. He's getting so old, he can't get around very good. I hope he's listening. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Shell looks like he did when I first met him. You know, he ain't ever gonna grow no hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is he? Is he writing stuff still, or is he? I think he. You know, he, I think he's around Martha's Vineyard, and uh, uh, he still writes. Yeah, he still writes. He was singing me a couple of things not too long ago. He's just a little more low profile than he used to right. be. He's still got his talent, sense of humor, and everything still intact. Just uh, keeping a low profile for... Uh, it's too bad he doesn't... I mean, I know I would like to see him out. Uh, he's a character, you know. Yeah. He's a character that shouldn't be lost with time, you know. But Cheryl never was one that, that uh, liked the limelight very much. He, he's that guy that's lurking, in the, <laughs> you know, over <laughs> in the in the wing. Yeah, you know, he was one of those. I'm gonna get him out of there one of these days. <laughs> Push him out on your stage one time. Yeah. Huh. Put fun. him in the spotlight. Yeah, get him to sing on TV. <laughs> so you got the uh, the Highwaymen album coming out in. Uh... Yeah, I got a question. Why don't I tell you what? Why don't you want to? Uh, I'm gonna let you get going because I know you got a busy schedule and stuff down there in uh, in Myrtle Beach. But uh, yeah, is it warm enough? Can you go swimming now? Or is it too cold for that? Oh, I'm not going to swim. <laughs> I, they got the ugliest women down there I've ever seen. I ain't going out on that. <laughs> That's scary looking. <laughs> no, I, you know, I, uh, we were just fixing to go to a sound check, and I was calling you right quick. All right, well, tell you what, since I got these tickets to give away for your show on the 9th up in Connecticut, you want to come up with a suitable question here? Sure. You want to, uh, we got five pairs, so think of a question that, uh, not too hard, but, uh, but hard enough that we're not winding up with people who, you know, people who we want to get people who want to go to your show, who know a little bit about you. Okay. Let me think. Just for a second here. Something that would really be good. They got to answer this question, right? That's right. Who's the oldest? <laughs> Willie or Johnny Cash? Okay. We'll do that. And uh, now I'll give you a couple of them. All right. And uh, who's the youngest highwayman? Okay. I think they know that one. Well, don't tell them. Okay. <laughs> Willie or Cash, and then we got Youngest Highwayman. Yeah. All right, so I'll ask that. So. Well, Waylon, I want to thank you very much for uh, taking the time out of your schedule to do this. It was uh, uh, a treat, you know. Well, Zach, I enjoyed it. I really did. Uh, when I get up in that area, I'll come up there and disc jockey with you. Oh, that would be great. Hey, Waylon, uh -huh. you know, uh, one thing I know, that when you used to do... Uh, your own station down at K Triple L uh -huh. in Lubbock. Uh, you used to sing the station IDs 
Uh-huh. So uh, next time, when you, if you ever come up here, I want you to prepare, if it's not too much trouble, a, a singing ID that you can do for us. <laughs> okay, what's the what's call letters now? W-K-C-R. W? K-C-R, like K- K-C-R. Right. I'll get you one. <laughs> you got a deal. All right. All right. All right, Waylon. Well, it's a treat. It was a treat. I'll talk to you again. Tell okay. Hi. I will. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.